Hi everyone, welcome to the second part of the lecture on conservation biology. And in this part of the lecture, we're going to focus on climate change. Now, if we look back at the IUCN's extinction threats, we see things like habitat loss and degradation, invasive alien species, overexploitation, pollution and diseases. But the fifth one here on the list is human-induced climate change. And as we go forward into the future, we believe that human-induced climate change will be a much more significant impact on species loss. So how does the climate work and where does climate change come from? So we're going to start with a basic understanding of the greenhouse effect, which is what keeps our planet warm. Now, if we look at the incoming solar radiation, some of that gets reflected back to, the, uh, to outer space, but a lot of that comes through the atmosphere and reaches the Earth's surface. When it reaches the Earth's surface, some of it is absorbed, shown by the, the red in this area here, and some of it is reflected. That Some of what is absorbed gets reflected then as infrared radiation, and that infrared radiation, as it's being reflected, will interact with the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and sometimes get reflected back to the Earth's surface. Now, as we increase the amount of greenhouse gases, we increase the likelihood that the infrared heat that's trying to escape the Earth's atmosphere ends up being reflected back to the Earth's surface. And so the greenhouse effect is what keeps our planet warm to start with. But as we have an increased greenhouse effect because we have added additional greenhouse gases to that layer, then we can cause a heating of the planet's surface. Now, if we look at the Earth with our atmosphere, and we look at our daytime temperature of 18 degrees Celsius averaged over the entire planet, and our nighttime temperature of 8 degrees Celsius over, averaged over the, night, the entire planet, we see a couple things here. One is that our atmosphere is a great blanket. It keeps our planet from getting extremely cold at night. Because without the atmosphere, we would lose a lot of heat to the outer space. And as an example, or as a comparison, if we look at mercury, which we know it's a lot closer to the sun, so it's definitely going to be hotter, we see that its daytime temperature is incredibly hot, 425 degrees Celsius. But what's shocking is because mercury has no atmosphere, the dark side of mercury is a negative 200 degrees Celsius. All of that heat that mercury gets during the daytime on the light side is lost on the dark side because there's no atmosphere. We can contrast that with the Earth, where we have temperatures that are uh, <clears throat> very close daytime and nighttime temperature because of the atmosphere and its ability to reflect infrared radiation and keep heat from escaping into outer space and contrasting that with mercury, where you have this amazing difference between night and day. Now the greenhouse effect is essentially that our atmosphere is a blanket. Mercury with its no atmosphere has that 600 degree difference between night and day, and the Earth has a 10 degree difference between night and day. So the question is, what happens when you put on a thicker blanket? What happens as you add greenhouse gases to the layer of the atmosphere that re can reflect infrared heat back to the Earth's surface. So to understand this, we need to kind of understand what some of the main greenhouse gases are. And the most important one is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a key part of the carbon cycle, and we've learned in earlier lectures that carbon dioxide pulled out of the air is what builds trees and builds primary biomass for plants and enter, you know, starts our food chains with primary production. Now, that carbon dioxide that's pulled out of the atmosphere uh, will change the balance of carbon dioxide in the outer atmosphere. And when, what happens then is, as a tree grows, it will reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And as a tree or its leaves decay, it will increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But this happens across the globe in essentially in a balance so that over time, 
without human disturbance and without human additions of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, there should be little effect of the natural carbon cycle on the greenhouse gas uh, concentrations. But what we see is with our natural carbon cycle, that it is a cycle and, and in uh, before the Industrial Revolution was a fairly well-balanced cycle. With the Industrial Revolution, we have things like deforestation, and deforestation results in a lot of trees being uh, cut down and a lot of decomposition of those trees, either through burning or through the decomposer web, uh, food web. And so that adds car atmospheric carbon dioxide. We also have a lot of animals, um, especially livestock, produce uh, greenhouse gases. Um, and we have another major issue, and probably the biggest issue we face, is the burning of fossil fuels that releases carbon dioxide. And that is a major driver of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, scientists were curious about this, and they wanted to look at the Earth's atmospheric composition in its most pristine state. So they decided to create an observatory in Hawaii on an island that was remote and isolated so that it would be observing essentially the unaltered Earth's atmospheric chemistry. And this is the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. And so this observation station allowed them to measure uh, carbon dioxide levels starting around 1960. And what they found was that each year the carbon dioxide level the following year was slightly higher. Now you can see that it goes up and down here, but the overall trend was this quite alarming increase in carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. And we know from looking at ice cores and fossil records that the Earth's atmosphere had about 270 parts per million of carbon dioxide before human, uh, the Industrial Revolution started. And by 1960, that had increased to 310, and now it is well over 400 parts per million that uh, the Earth's atmosphere has reached. Now, why does it go up and down? Let's take a look at that. And it goes back to what I said about the carbon cycle with plants growing and plants decaying. So when we have our winter here, all that leaf matter that plants grew in the springtime begins to fall and decay. And that causes the carbon dioxide level to go up in a given year. Then the leaf out in the new production of leaves causes a lot more carbon dioxide to be stored in trees and other plants, and that causes the carbon dioxide to go down in a given year. But what we've seen is that the following year, there's a greater increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, this increase that we're seeing as we look from one point at the end of a year to the other point at the end of a year, that is the com uh, contribution of fossil fuel burning and loss of rainforests and burning of forests that has caused an increased carbon dioxide level in our atmosphere. So naturally, this cycle would balance itself, but with those additions, we see that it is increasing uh, ever, every year um, as we go forward. So what does this do? Well, this becomes a thicker blanket when we think about our atmospheric uh, blanket created by the greenhouse gas layer in the atmosphere. Now, <clears throat> if we look at world uh, emissions of carbon dioxide, we see first off that the United States was a major emitter throughout most of this and the largest emitter throughout most of this. The European Union, shown here in green, was a fairly major emitter as well. And both of these places have had a slight downturn in the amount of carbon dioxide that we're emitting annually. The red line here represents something that's fairly alarming, and that is the growth of China and its contribution to the global carbon dioxide. And so China has created a, um, a, a, a rapid increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But the United States and Russia I'm sorry, the United States and the EU have made it, had played a big role in this in the past. And if we look at 
1750 to 2050, we see that um, the United States of the megatons of CO2 in the atmosphere has accounted for 24.5% of that. China only 13.9%, Russia 6.8%. And you can see that the United States over that time that we've seen this increase in carbon dioxide from 270 parts per million to over 400 parts per million has been the major contributor of carbon dioxide to that. Now if we look at our annual CO2 emissions, remember that um, you have this from burning of fossil fuels and people will say, well, we're also cutting down rainforests and losing a lot of, or releasing a lot of carbon dioxide due to rainforest being cut down. That is incorporated in this figure here with the green line, that's land use change and that's the amount of carbon dioxide being released due to land use change, essentially cutting down and conversion of forests um, and when those decay or burn, releasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But you can see that um, since the 1950s, uh, fossil fuel emissions have far eclipsed what land use change is causing. All right. Now, people will say, when we have a cold day in the winter, things like, well, that, that blows your idea of climate change, that there, there can't be climate change because it's, we've had a very cold winter, for example. Or we have snow in April, and therefore there's no climate change. So that is confusing the idea of weather, which are these day-to-day -day spikes that you would have in temperature, with the idea of climate, which is the long-term average of temperatures for a given area. So this is Ithaca, New York, and the blue line shows the da daily data for year 2007, and the green line shows the average for the 116 years leading up to 2007. So the green line is climate, the blue line is weather, and climate is what you expect. Weather is what you get. So that's a great statement by a scientist who studies climate change. And so we may not know what our temperature is going to be next year on July 20th. But based on climate records, we could predict that it will probably be about 84 degrees. We may end up with a day that's cold or we may end up with a day that's incredibly warm. And that's the weather effect rather than the climate effect. Now this figure is a really interesting figure and it will show you the um, change in climate over the last um, many years and it will tell you it shows how climate uh, temperatures have increased the blue is where temperatures are below the long-term average and the red is where temperatures are above the long-term average so I'm going to play this now and you can watch as it goes. So it starts in 1880, and what we see around 1880 is the temperatures are inside that ring of zero degrees Celsius, and we have cooler periods during that time where the temperatures are staying inside that ring, that long-term average. Now we see by the 1930s, we start to see some years where it's eclipsing that long-term average and getting outside of the zero degree Celsius ring. And what we're gonna see going forward from the 1960s is that many of the years are far outside that historic average. So the last 50 years, our temperatures have gone far outside that long-term average and become the hottest years on record. Now you can see this from the side and see how temperatures have increased over all that time with the years uh, in the late 2010s being the hottest years on record. So this is captured in this graph here as well that shows the temperature records from the year 1000 to uh, the year 2010 and
So this is captured in this figure here that shows the temperature record from the year 1000 to the year 2000. And it illustrates this by reconstructing temperature records from ice cores and tree rings. And then in recent years, it overlays actual temperature records because remember, we haven't had thermometers for all that long. So actual temperature records have not been available for that long. Now, what this shows us is that over the long period of time, the temperatures were um, oscillating below what we have for kind of our current average of the last couple hundred years. And in the last 200 years, essentially 150 years since the Industrial Revolution really took off, and we started burning a lot of fossil fuels, we see that global temperatures in the Northern Hemisphere have gone up pretty substantially um, during that time. So this is climate change. This is the increase in Earth's surface temperature due to increased greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. What we can conclude from this is that during the Industrial Revolution, there has been uh, an increased greenhouse effect um, and that this is causing global warming. Now, there also are natural cycles that can cause global warming, but what we see currently occurring cannot be explained by any of those natural cycles like sunspots, like volcanic activity, any of that. It shows that there's a very strong human fingerprint in the climate change that we are currently observing. So where is the warming? The warming is most extreme in some of the areas of the uh, western United States, in Africa, and some areas up even into the Arctic Circle. Um, we see most parts, parts of the planet are warming pretty substantially um, from 1901 to 2012, with some areas actually um, getting extremely warm, especially up in the Arctic. We don't see here any areas really in the blue except the North Atlantic Ocean. Um, so overall, the entire Earth's surface has been warming. All right. <clears throat> this, again, goes back to my point about whether you can explain this based on natural causes. And if we model the Earth's climate on natural causes, we would have this green line that we see here. If we model it based on human and natural causes, we have the red line here, and what we've observed is this blue line. So you can see that tracks much better with the human and natural causes both included in the calculations. Now what happens with climate change? What do we observe as far as the biological side of climate change? Well, there are several biological impacts that happen as, as the climate changes. Spring is arriving earlier, and what does that mean? What does it mean for spring to arrive earlier? Well, it means that birds are migrating earlier. We see birds arriving earlier in the season every year. We see trees producing their leaves earlier in the year, and we see some types of insects hatching earlier in the year. So these are all things that are things that typically occur in spring, and now they're happening earlier every year. Organisms are also shifting their ranges. So species that need a certain temperature range will move to areas where they can uh, better fit their temperature, their optimal temperature. We see an increase in storms and droughts, and that's a very alarming problem that has occurred as a result of climate change. And that's why we don't just refer to global warming, because we want to take into effect that there are into account that there are major changes in climate, such as storms and droughts, and those have major repercussions uh, in terms of biology. Another very alarming one is that we see that the glaciers are melting, and that changes sea levels, and that changes the salinity of the sea, which has impacts on the biology of ocean organisms. And perhaps the most alarming is the loss of Arctic sea ice, and that loss of Arctic sea ice has multiple consequences. One is that when you change the, it from a white ice cap 
to dark ocean surface, the ocean then absorbs more heat and it exacerbates the problem. And one of the key things that we've seen with the loss of Arctic sea ice is a change in polar bears' ability to hunt because they depend on Arctic sea ice for their hunting. Now, in terms of range shifts, we see some interesting things. So a lot of species are shifting their ranges toward the poles, moving far, um, farther north in the northern hemisphere and farther south in the southern hemisphere. Now, the problem is, if species one species depends on another, and it can't tolerate the temperatures, um, and it migrates, if the species it depends on has not also had its range change, then it gets to be an ecological mismatch where it finds itself in an ecosystem that doesn't have the other species it depends on. So different migration rates for codependent species are a big problem. Tree ranges, for example, are shifting north and west, mostly in um, the <laughs> eastern United States. And so we see, what we're seeing here is that trees are essentially moving northward or slightly westward um, as temperatures warm. A lot of species that live in mountains are migrating up mountains, and they're doing so faster in tropical areas than in temperate areas. This concern about birds migrating earlier is something that you can actually observe. And if you um, look at historical records, say for example for the turkey vulture, they used to have a, a festival every year in central Ohio honoring the arrival of turkey vultures on March 19th. And every year from 1900 to about 1980 or 1990, turkey vultures tended to arrive on March 19th in Hinckley, Ohio. Now what we see is that turkey vultures in some numbers will winter year-round at that latitude. So they're not migrating that far south. We see them arriving in Michigan, which is north of Ohio, by um, as early as March 1st now. And last winter with the mild winter, I actually observed turkey vultures in Michigan in January. So we have climate change going on. We can't really refute that. And we need to figure out then what can be done about it. Is it already too late? So the question of whether it's too late corresponds to whether we think we can remove some of that carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere from the atmosphere. And ways to do this are carbon capture, where we would use some sort of mechanical means uh, to create chemical cycles that would pull carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, often storing it then deep underground, or carbon sequestration, where we take advantage of plants' natural ability to pull carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now, if we look at the capacity for carbon capture projects, um, and we have very limited capacity for these currently. Um, in terms of the number of megatons of carbon dioxide that per year. Now, if we want to achieve net zero, meaning that we are stopping emitting carbon dioxide, stopping increasing the level beyond 410 parts per million, then what we need to do is have this level of carbon capture occur by 2030. So we would need a major ramp up in carbon capture ability to get there. So we have very limited carbon capture ability. Um, and you can see this is what's operating as the light blue, what's under construction, what could be advanced development, what's feasible, and what's net zero. So you see that we're, we're not likely to get there just with carbon capture technology in the short term. But what we can do is take advantage of the fact that plants sequester CO2, and we can focus largely on reforestation efforts to increase the amount of carbon captured by forests, where we've lost a lot of forests globally, we can start to bring them back. So this Global Forest Watch map here shows where rainforests have been lost. So we look at Nicaragua here, lots of rainforest loss, and that's where I do a lot of my research. We look at the Amazon, Brazilian Amazon, 
Peruvian Amazon, the Colombian Amazon, lots of forest loss in those areas. And by regrowing rainforest, we could capture a lot of carbon dioxide and slow the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This has a lot of huge benefits. One is that it would help with the issues of poverty that occur in these countries. Obviously, it would offset carbon dioxide emissions and combat global warming. And it also would slow the trend of uh, tropical deforestation that we're seeing. So I've been involved in some of these projects and found them quite rewarding, but I think the future really is going to depend on ramping up projects where we do uh, a lot of carbon sequestration. Now, this alone won't do it. We need to stop burning fossil fuels at the rate we're doing it, and we need to also have carbon capture technologies. But what we can see is not just from a carbon sequestration point of view, but from a wildlife uh, recovery point of view, that uh, this type of project with reforestation in the tropical rainforest can have great benefits. And here is a 15-year-old rainforest in Nicaragua and a toucan uh, shown in the tree here using those trees. So just in 15 years, this went from a pasture that you would never find a toucan in to a forest that toucans can survive in. So as we look forward and we think about climate change, we've got multiple things to consider. One is how are we going to fight it? And the best way to fight it is to think about reducing the amount of carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere, as well as figuring out ways to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Our most readily available way to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere right now is through carbon sequestration with plants. And in the future, we'll need carbon capture technologies such as those being developed at certain universities that would allow us to take even more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So to help keep our planet a temperature that we can tolerate and to help minimize things like major storms, um, then we will need to really work together in addressing climate change in the future.